Hi everybody and welcome back to another Royal Musings video and today I hope to bring you some nice calming bird sounds as I talk and chat about my favourite topic which is of course the British Royal Family. Now I have a list of things that I want to talk about that have kind of happened in the media or been on people's lips over the past couple of days. So I'm going to start I think with South Park. So in the previous episode, let's just go straight into it, I made a few comments about it, but I said quite clearly that I hadn't seen the episode. So a few days ago, I did actually watch the episode. Um, so South Park, I did used to watch it back in the day, and I did used to find it funny back then, but I haven't watched it for many, 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 many years. Um, I don't know if other people are the same, but I do know that South Park has a huge history of lampooning celebrities <laughs> you know that is what they do um so it came as no 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 surprise to me that they decided to tackle the harry and Meghan issue now going back previously they have also you know they've commented on um i think they did a um a sketch or, or a whole episode i'm not quite sure what it was of william and catherine's wedding where they made fun of them so <laughs> In South Park, they take no prisoners. So, like I said, it was no surprise that they decided to tackle Harry and Meghan. Um, in the episode, it was called the Worldwide Privacy Tour. Um, and it was quite funny. Now, I should prob probably say that I don't actually think Harry and Meghan have, have ever said that they left because they want privacy. However, they have done lots of things to indicate that they want more control on their own terms. And in various things, um, you know, the Oprah interview and, of course, um, Harry's book, he's kind of indicated that there was a level of press intrusion that they felt, from their own point of view, um, was unacceptable, that they couldn't deal with, that put extra pressure on, that they were not defended from. That's all, obviously, from Harry's perspective and point of view. We haven't actually had any response um, from the royal family side. Um, so... I think South Park have basically been based that episode, that whole episode, on what they have seen. Um, it's very much a response um, that I think a lot of people feel. Now, of course, there's going to be... No, it's, it's a way that people view Harry and Meghan through what they've done, through the choices and actions that they have made. Now, I know that there are going to be some very ardent Harry and Meghan supporters um, who, who probably won't even be watching this video. Um, then again, they might be. And in their eyes, Harry and Meghan literally do no wrong. But the one thing that... I think even they will find it quite hard-pressed uh, to ignore, is that people are going to form opinions and views on Harry and Meghan based on what they say and what they do. South Park, the episode of South Park, is like holding up a mirror. Um, you know, if Harry and Meghan were literally to hold up a mirror, that is what, that is how, the way that South Park portrayed them is the way that the majority of people see them. Their ardent supporters, their ardent fans, obviously do not, um, and they will protest to the highest level. Um, but the majority of people see Harry and Meghan the same way that South Park has portrayed them. Um, and a lot of people will be saying that South Park hit the nail on the head. I mean, at the very end of the episode, you know, Harry sort of skips off saying that he doesn't need the celebrity life and doesn't need the attention and the branding. And then he asks Meghan to come with him and then she sort of stays behind. I mean, it's all very much what people think, that they're you know, playing the victim on, on the branding cards. If you watch the episode, you know, it's got all these different things and then at the end it's victim. Um, because people do think that they are just playing the victim that it's it's and his book is known as wah instead of spare you know there's a lot of things like i say it's just like holding up a mirror and a reflection and harry and Meghan, you know never mind having their lawyers cast an eye over south park although they have denied that they have denied that they're going to sue and i think again that is a reflection of how they think that they will be perceived because i think if they were to file any kind of legal action against south park it would just show um, how kind of 
uh, how high up they they hold themselves in their opinions of themselves. Do you know, do you know what I mean? It's like it's like they would. Um, it just goes to show them to be very conceited, um, not being able to take a joke, um, not being able to take any kind of criticism, justified or unjustified, whichever side of the fence that you sit on. But like I say, what you cannot deny, I don't think, is that that is how the majority of people see Harry and Meghan, just like holding up a mirror. Um, and I, I think Harry and Meghan do need to take a good look. Harry and Meghan's camp need to take a really good look at the South Park episode, because if they want to um, sort of turn things around for Harry and Meghan in the public opinion stakes, and when I say public opinion, I'm not talking about their ardent fans and their ardent supporters. I'm talking about the wider context here. They have got a lot of a lot of work to do. The actions of Harry and Meghan over the past couple of years have well over the past really year. I mean, I suppose they held a reasonable amount of support in the US um, until the Netflix documentary and the book. I mean, that has just their popularity, generally speaking, has tanked. Um, so their PR people have got a lot of work to do if they want to rebrand it. And looking at South Park actually really shows them the key issues and things that they, that they need to concentrate on. Um, so yeah, it just goes... To, I don't think it went well for Harry and Meghan. I think when you've been lampooned to that level on South Park, it kind of shows that, you know, popularity is fading. Also, um, there was a bit on one of the cards about um, First Lady Botherer, I think it said, if you look really, really closely, uh, obviously, um, obviously... I suppose, pertaining to uh, Meghan's maybe wanting to get close to the Obamas to maybe further her own political career, that kind of thing. Anyway, so I did watch the episode. It was funny. It was, you know, it was satirical. And that's, I think, the context that it should be taken in. Right, so the next story that I want to talk about is one... It's kind of... It's not really a story as such. It's kind of clearing up, I think... A, on a particular subject, what I think happened. So Paul Burrell has came out. I mean, Paul Burrell says a lot. Of course, Paul Burrell being Diana's former butler when she was, uh, well, just before she passed away, he was in service to her. So he does know a lot about what went on. Uh, and perhaps it's important to consider that he knows a lot more about Diana as an adult, as an adult to adult, friend to friend, employer to employee, whereas William and Harry will always kind of view her as a mother from a young person's perspective, Paul Burrell knew her as an adult, had adult interactions with her, um, and, you know, has an adult memory. And of course, people's memories do fail them. But I think sometimes when you remember things from your childhood, it can be slightly distorted. Anyway, Paul Burrell has waded in on the issue of Diana's engagement ring and her Cartier tank watch and the subject of who got what. So the initial story that's always been banded around is that after her passing, um, the boys were offered to choose one thing from her personal possessions, I think it must have been jewellery, um, to remember her by. And the story goes that uh, William chose the Cartier tank watch and um, Harry chose the engagement ring, the sapphire blue diamond engagement ring that Catherine now wears. Then the story went that prior to the engagement of William and Catherine, William asked Harry if he could have the ring and they'd do a swap for the tank watch and the ring. Anyway, that story persisted, you know, until Harry put in spare that the ring was never his to give because William already had the ring in his possession. But then Paul Burrell wades in and says that that's a lie because he was there when William chose the tank watch because um, William apparently isn't someone who's obsessed with sort of shiny, valuable things. He attached more sentimental value to, of course, the Cartier tank watch. And then Harry chose the engagement ring. He said he actually witnessed this happening and it was his suggestion, Paul Burrell's suggestion, that the boys actually choose something of their mother's possessions to remember them by. So I was doing a little bit of thinking and reading between the lines of the, the, the wording, the particular wording 
from the book and knowing sort of what happened you know that William did actually have the ring to give to Catherine this is what I have deduced from it so I think that Paul Borrell is absolutely correct I think um, I think that William did choose the tank watch and I think that Harry did choose the ring and I think they did have it in their own possessions for a certain amount of time then what must have happened is that sometime after having the tank watch and the ring William must have asked Harry if he could if they could do a swap and I, I don't know how far this is the bit that we don't know we don't know how soon how far after having the watch and the ring that this kind of swap exchange happened but anyway William ended up with the ring and then Harry must have had the tank watch or William had both William ended up with the tank watch and the ring so then obviously when it came to the engagement William um, proposed to Catherine with Diana's in engagement ring, which meant that William didn't have to ask Harry for the ring at that point because he already had it, which then ties in with what Harry said. So that's what I think happened uh, from that. So a bit of a convoluted way to go about it, but um, I think there wasn't particularly anyone, I don't think anyone particularly lied about it. I don't really think Harry lied about it in the book, but I don't think Harry expanded and told the whole story um which is i think a problem with the whole of his book really you don't actually get the full picture you only get a particular slice of it right so next on my list is lady susan hussing now i did speak about lady susan hussing uh, um, a few maybe a week ago where i said that hussy's back and you know she has been seen back on the scene um, in royal circles she was at church at sandringham in norfolk well, there's a plane going over you can probably hear it but we will continue so lady susan hussy was at church with the king and the queen so we know that she was sort of back i'm gonna have to pause it's a helicopter there we go, it's gone. <laughs> it was a helicopter just flying over. Um, so we know that Lady Susan Hussey is back behind the scenes because obviously she must have been staying with the King and Queen at Sandringham um, a week or so ago. Anyway, it turns out that she has been representing Princess Anne at a funeral. So there was a funeral, must have been of people that they both knew. And Princess Anne couldn't attend. I think she had some prior engagements. So she asked Lady Susan Hussey to represent her and her immediate family um, at the funeral. So it wasn't recorded in, in any official documents. It doesn't have to be, although sometimes representations are recorded. It kind of, I suppose it just depends. Maybe it was seen as a bit controversial to record Lady Susan Hussey. Um, officially representing Princess Anne in the court circular or any sort of court records. But anyway, Lady Susan Hussey was spotted representing Princess Anne and she was also seen going into Buckingham Palace via the servant's um, entrance. So whether or not she was returning to pick up belongings uh, or whether or not she was, she's actually been taken on behind the scenes, maybe she's taken on by Princess Anne. I don't know. But she is back. Um very low key so i don't know what's happening there will king charles take her back to her former former role uh, that honorary position of course she's she was no longer a lady in waiting anyway um but the queen's former ladies in waiting that were still that are still with us basically uh, that haven't passed away uh, were were still retained by the king in an honorary um position to help organize events um so is she making a full return let me know in the comment section do you think that lady susan hussey should make a full return are you glad to see her back on the scene or does it make you angry i don't know let me know in the comment section below my next story is about princess charlotte so this kind of fits in i think now i think it was it was a trusted journalist that I think does have their ear to the floor when it comes to the royal family. And I think this is probably one of those occasions where there has been a little bit of a palace leak to the press. And it is about Princess Charlotte, um, about what her nickname might be at school. And apparently the children at school have nicknamed her or given her the moniker Warrior Princess 
reminds me very much of Xena, Xena the warrior princess. I don't think Charlotte's going to come out, um, you know, dressed like Xena, warrior princess when she's older. But um, but no, apparently she's very tough, uh, very sort of action woman, um, you know, and she's got this this moniker of being warrior princess. It's kind of almost like a nickname that you would have expected perhaps Princess Anne to have when she was younger. Now, I have always said that um, perhaps Princess Charlotte has a little touch of the Princess Anne's about her. She seems very, very robust, very solid, very no nonsense, very no fuss. Um, and yeah, I don't think she's afraid to get to get dirty, to get to muck in. Um, you know, she likes being out in nature and wildlife. So having this kind of tough exterior i think is going to help her in her later life i don't believe any of these rumors that you know she's going to have a normal life with a regular job i mean can you see her at the drive through window in mcdonald's or you know i mean even being a lawyer or solicitor or i just i don't know i can't see it myself personally however that said if that is what you know princess charlotte harbors ambitions for um, then perhaps that is something, you know, that she will have the ability to do. However, I do see her future role, long-term future role, at least, as the Princess Royal eventually when that title becomes available. Now, some people have also said, what about, you know, could she join the army? Could she go into the military? Now, this hasn't been done before for a female. Now, I know things have changed. I know times have changed, perceptions of um, gender has changed very, very much. Certainly in the line of succession, females are no longer pushed behind younger brothers. And that actually started um, in effect with Princess Charlotte, because obviously Princess Charlotte in former times would have been pushed behind Prince Louis in the line of succession. But that hasn't happened um, because the rules were changed under Queen Elizabeth II. So... So things could be different. Maybe, you know, if Princess Charlotte does want to go into full-time royal duties after leaving school, whatever level of education she finishes at, um, you know, perhaps she could go into the forces and have a stint in the armed forces. Um, the issue is that that hasn't previously happened, so I don't know whether or not it's something that she would ever harbour any kind of uh, interest in. Um, it's certainly something that could be explored. There isn't really a reason, I suppose, why she couldn't. It's just that it's never been done before. So this kind of warrior princess uh, moniker does lend itself quite well to that notion. So let me know your thoughts on that one. Oh, so next up is this ongoing story about Sarah Ferguson's townhouse and Princess and Prince Andrew with Royal Lodge. So. As I've said before, I don't necessarily think that... Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it depends how much money he does actually have. If he does have enough money to finance the 200 and something, £50,000 a year that Royal Lodge is expected uh, the cost of it to run, then he could stay there indefinitely. As I've suggested, he could also move to a cheaper property owned by the king, which of course I suggested as being Wood Farm. I thought that would be a suitable property, but we're going to have to wait and see on on, on that front. Um, a note about the £250,000 given by the Queen annually, that actually turns out was a figure from 1991. So the actual figure could have been a lot more. It could have been close to a million, um, perhaps, uh, from the Duchy of Lancaster. Now, the Duchy of Lancaster itself is worth, you know, about round about £20 million a year, because um, that's gone up over time as well. And the Queen was supposed to annually, um, you know, review the finances. So I imagine that what Prince Andrew received from her had gone up, at least with inflation, over the time since then. So the 250000 figure um, is expected to be much higher could be anywhere from 500,000 to a million. So Charles has kind of said, I'm not going to pay that much. It could be slashed. So if running costs are about 200,000, if Andrew received 500,000, that would still be able to cover perhaps the running costs of Royal Lodge. But then again, I don't know how much it does actually cost, especially with all the rising bills 
Andrew will not be immune to any of the gas and electric prices and staffing costs and all the rest of it because that's very, very expensive. So I suggested Wood Farm, a much smaller property. But the, the newspapers have been speculating, will they move into the townhouse, uh, Fergie's townhouse? Because it's been done up, it's been renovated over the past year, but no tenants have moved in. It hasn't actually come up for rent. So some people are speculating, are they keeping it for Andrew and Sarah? I don't think so. Even though it would be a London base, I think it's too public. And I don't think that Andrew would go for that. If anything, he would hold out for a, a small apartment um, within one of the royal palaces, maybe St. James, maybe Kensington. Um, so, no, I don't think that's going to happen. It's not impossible, but I just don't think so. I think what's more likely is perhaps a move to a smaller, de detached property somewhere on a royal estate. Um, Sandringham would be perfect, which is why I think wood farm is still the option that i kind of think would be most suitable so again it's one of those stories we're just going to have to see where that takes us okay so in last in the last episode we spoke about the baftas and of course catherine wearing that uh, repurposed white dress which i loved that gown the, the actual gown i really truly loved i wasn't fond of the gloves um and a lot of people in the comment section agreed with me about the gloves um just the colour of the gloves. I actually quite liked the fact that she paired it with gloves. I, I really like those long, elegant, classic Hollywood glamour gloves. Um, but I think, I still think they should have been white. Uh, just to go with the dress, I think it would have blended better. It was a little bit jarring for me. I think it, it took me out of the moment. Anyway, that said, I thought the actual repurposed gown was absolutely gorgeous. Um, I really, really loved that. And I like the shoes and the earrings. And Although I would have liked to have seen um, some diamonds, I think, some proper diamonds. Anyway, um, I did show the, the butt slap, which none of us were expecting the butt slap. I mean, William and Catherine famously, you know, don't really have or show much PDA. Uh, but they have been being a little bit more touchy-feely um, lately. And a lip reader. So I'm going to... Now, I don't know whether or not these lip readers get it right. But anyway, it, it offers... A lip reader has looked at, looked at them uh, because there was a shot in front and there was a shot behind a video footage of them. So you do actually see their lips. And a lip reader has deduced what they think uh, was said at the time, which kind of unlocks why it all happened, or rather a version of why it all happened. So apparently, Catherine looked into the crowd and saw a man tap a woman on the butt. Now, we can speculate all we like on whether or not the man was, whether it was his partner or not anyway. But Catherine said that she saw that happen. So apparently she said, that man, he tapped her on the bottom. So, and then William apparently turned to her and said, did he? Um, and then she replied, that was so funny. No, after the did he, that's when she tapped him on the butt to demonstrate, to reenact what happened. And then she said, that was so funny. So <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that because um, it's just one of those stories, isn't it? Where, you know, you wonder why she tapped him on the butt. Some people were speculating, was it to, you know, move him on, get his attention? But it seems like if you believe the lip reader, that it was because she saw that happen in the crowd. Let me know what you think. Is that what you think happened? Okay, so the next story is quite a cute one. Um, Catherine was on a royal engagement and she went to the Oxford House nursing home and she met a 109-year-old resident uh, who was, whose name was Nora. And they were talking in conversation and it came up about favourite meals. And I think Nora said that hers was kidneys and sprouts what a combination, my goodness. But if it gets you to 109, uh, I'm not arguing with Nora. Nora, I think, has probably got the right idea. So if Nora says kidneys and sprouts, then kidneys and sprouts it is. But Catherine replied that she also really, really liked kidneys. Now, kidneys is a bit of a strange thing, I suppose, um, to like these days. M many people these days have an aversion to, I suppose, offal if you like. Um, you know, most people don't like liver, kidneys, heart, all those sorts of things. Now, I have to admit, 
I myself am put off by the thought of what it is. I am a meat eater, I'm not a vegan, I'm not a vegetarian, although I do like veggie food, to be quite honest. A lot of the times I will choose a veggie option, but I'm not, I'm not vegan, I'm not a vegetarian. I do eat meat. But just the thought of eating internal organs, it just puts me off. Now, I know that when I was younger, I did used to eat liver because my nan used to, used to serve it with onions, liver and onions, and mashed potato and veg. And she didn't used to tell me what it was. So I used to eat it and it was very nice. So I actually do like the taste. But once I found out what it was, just the thought of what it was put me off and I've never eaten it since. So I do know that I like the taste of it. And I must admit, I don't think I've ever tried... No, to be fair, I have had steak and kidney pie. So, and that was nice. So I must like it. But to just have that, to have the thought of it, is just... Ugh. Anyway, let me know what you think. But Catherine is partial to, um, to, to kidney. Maybe she meant in a kidney pie. I don't know. Let me know. <laughs> let me know your thoughts on that one. Okay, so thank you for watching this video. Now, like I said, um, I, I have been starting to put some photos in these videos so you can see what I'm talking about. But the purpose of these is just to relax. It's, it's so that you can, you can turn off the screen, you can put me on in the background when you're doing work, and you can almost use this video like a podcast. You know, there's not terribly too much going on for you to focus on visually it's very relaxing um, and that is the purpose of it so i think a lot of people are kind of um some people are watching it and really enjoying it it's a it's a format that i really enjoy it's something i quite like coming out here and just musing about the royal family talking about the stories listening to the birds it's very relaxing it's very chill it's very calm vibes and i hope that is what you are finding like i said if you want to convert me into a podcast it's very easy just turn me on on your mobile device pop me in your pocket and there you are bingo you have a podcast so <laughs> so thank you for watching this video if you have enjoyed it then please give it a big old thumbs up don't forget to share it on social media. And of course, do hit that bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. So from me, to you all, and goodbye.